Welcome, everyone, to the latest edition of the Reimagine Mobility podcast series. I'm here joined by Alex Taylor, the founder of Orb Aerospace. Thanks, Alex, for joining us. Um, very excited to hear more about what you guys are doing because this is a definitely very much a mobility topic and a mobility topic that will take us way into the future. But before we get into some of these things, maybe introduce yourself and share a little bit what is what is Orb Aerospace? What the heck are you guys doing? And uh, and where you want to take this thing? Yeah, thanks, Stefan. It's great to great to join you guys as another Michigan company. Uh, yeah, my name is Alex Taylor. I uh, grew up overseas. I uh, mean, you know, we were doing uh, missions work overseas and started Orb Aerospace to be a little bit less like the flying taxis and a little bit more like the flying cowboys. Uh, so using this idea that, you know, 80% of the world has, has never experienced aviation before. And that's the 80% of the world that really needs it. So you're talking about desperate needs, developing nations. Um, and so while we saw the rest of the world were building uh, these vehicles to augment consumerism uh, so that you could have you know, faster transportation where there was transportation, how do you build transportation mobility where there is no transportation and no mobility? And, uh, and so I grew up overseas, understood that there was these endemic problems uh, in the way that, you know, you know the, how we connected uh, these, these, these communities with way less resources than we had in the U.S. Came back, unable to get my pilot's license, started building drones when I was 12. And so necessity is the mother of all invention. My parents couldn't afford to pay for a pilot's license. I, one of my friends once said, the best thing my parents ever did for me is uh, that they gave me an allowance. So uh, uh, and some like $50 every week. And I, I said for a while there when we moved back, the best thing my parents ever did for me is they couldn't afford to. And so everything that I, I wanted, I, I had to get for myself. And I wanted passionately to become a pilot. I uh, wanted to, to and, and that led to the necessity to, to, to make my own money. Made that meant that I, I had to get into aviation through drones. It was, it was kind of the, the entry um, for a 12-year-old kid with, uh, yeah, living in a small town in rural Michigan, and uh, and so started building drones, and that that led to uh, uh, this sort of question, which is why don't we incorporate some of this technology in general aviation? Why why is it that a uh, one hour in a Cessna that was built sixty years ago cost me two hundred fifty dollars? You know, me as an American with all of this privilege, this time, money, talent, resources. How is it that I struggle to get my pilot's license? You know, how is it that that is still such an inhibiting factor for me? And if it's inhibiting for me as the top, you know, less than 5% of the global population, what does that mean for the world that I just came from? You know, a world where uh, living in tents and spending all of the money you made that day just on your food, just on your tea, uh, just on dinner uh, to feed your family uh, is the reality for, you know, the vast majority of the global population. And so saw all of this opportunity, this privilege, and, you know, we're the only aerospace company in the world right now um, who's trying to reach the unreached and connect every village. And so it's been a long journey. I'm excited to, uh, to get into the details with you guys. But in a nutshell, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's Alex Taylor. Very nice. So then, right, let's move right into how you... Perfect for this podcast, how you help reimagine the mobility. So you're not just imagining it, you're actually doing it. So tell us a little bit about your vehicle, if we can call it that way. And and what are some of the, the cool features that you've, again, taken over from the early drones that you developed or built and then flew into now something that's a whole, a whole lot bigger. So tell us a little bit about the technology uh, behind those oh, things. Man. Yeah, so I don't want to give away, um, I don't want to give away the the ethos at Orb is, is one of these, like, you know, we've a hard fought, hard won. Uh, some of the design conclusions that we came to uh, are a result of trying something and it, and it really not working. Um, and so, yeah, to answer your question, Stefan, uh, so we, we call these aircraft Orbs. Um, I think that's a, a name that's going to become more uh, colloquial as, we, as, we, as, as these aircraft become more prolific. Um, so electric vertical takeoff and landing is kind of like the horseless carriage version of the word, you know, car. And so we, we were looking for what's, I'm not going to call this an eVTOL. I'm not going to, you know, saying an eVTOL just landed in my backyard makes every, you know, everybody sound like a super nerd. 
And so we knew that there, it was going to be called something else in the sort of layman's terms. And we were looking for what is that, what is that thing? And uh, orb is an English, you know, an English word that uh, isn't generally used in conversation. So it's kind of fair game to call, to use that as a name for something else. But it also represents something I think that's critical is, you know, orb in Webster's Dictionary is this sort of floating object, uh, celestial object, you know, stars are called orbs. Um, and so it's already flying. It's already networked, you know, in the sky. And, and so we, and it, orb has just caught on. And so we call these vehicles orbs. Um, and, uh, in the vertical takeoff and landing, um, tra- what we call transition vehicles. So they take off vertically and they transition to forward flight. Again, they're, they're, they're a similar, I would say configuration to um, the flying taxis um, that you see that have, you know, the, the, all these flying taxi concepts, but we're applying it in a radically new way. And I think that's where the differentiating factors are between Orb and the, you know, three to 400 other eVTOL companies and, and projects is that, you know, in addition to taking off vertically, what if you could uh, go transpacific? So taking off vertically for the sake of taking off vertically is, 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 is kind of pointless. What you're trying to do is eliminate infrastructure. And so it doesn't make any sense from our perspective uh, to bring a thing that eliminates infrastructure into a place that already has a ton of infrastructure and then build more on top of that or facilitate this, this mobility device that honestly has way too many other sustainment factors to really be... Uh, You know, you have maintenance personnel and you have power charging requirements. And so pure battery electric aircraft were kind of off the table from the onset. Vertical takeoff and landing was on the table because we're going to places that don't have runways. So it's out of necessity that we're building these, uh, you know, building a vertical takeoff and landing. But but if if it can do both, why not do both? Why not use runways when you have runways and why not use VTOL when you don't? And so how do you design an airplane with this many requirements? This is you know, a, a convergence, I think, of capabilities that we've never seen before. And it's, 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 people often mistake orbs as being the product of orb aerospace. Our, our product is not orbs. Our product is the network that orbs create. And so once you make all these deciding factors and I'm not going to be pure battery electric, I need to go, I need to go far. I need to go fast. I need to go everywhere. Um, I need to eliminate infrastructure and so I'm going to developing nations that have these desperate needs. Um, you know, it turns out that a developed nation, when it goes to war, uh, gets, has the infrastructure of a developing nation. And, and so we had a, I'm sorry, I don't know who let a dog into my office. <laughs> we broke the, we broke the handle to my lock. And so now the dog can let itself in and that's awesome. It's terrible. Um, yeah, so we're asking this question, which is, you know, if we're going to a place that has no infrastructure, you're building the airplane to replace the infrastructure. And so it's it's oh, it's a, a completely new paradigm. In addition to mobility, how do you build network infrastructure, you know, fuel, personnel, transportation? You become actually the the logistics backbone of the entire economy. And so it's a far broader reaching than just move people and things faster. It becomes a how do I bake into this aircraft the dependencies that you are required to take a developing nation and give it 10 times the velocity 10 times the the scale uh of their logistics network of a developing nation of a developed nation so how do you take uh not just like it's not better than roads it's like replace roads in places that have none um it's a completely different set of requirements in and, and so that set Orb apart initially with, you know, we talked about being the humanitarian, the world's humanitarian war force. And, and so we've got, uh, uh, I think that, that really is a deciding factor. Nobody's building these aircraft uh, to go for these huma- humanitarian aid disaster relief situations. Nobody's building them for 80% of the population. Um, and so I'm going to take off vertically because I need to eliminate the runway. Um, but if I have one, I can use that runway to self-deploy say trans-Pacific or trans transatlantic. So how do you take something that can do regional air mobility at a small scale? That same exact asset without any modification can also get you from point A to point B, regardless of where it's at in the world, without being dependent on any other third-party infrastructure. So 
becomes a situation where not only are you infrastructure independent, you are the infrastructure. So you, you, you sus- the, the orbs themselves, once they have the critical mass to establish the network, say go from San Diego to Hawaii, um, once you've established that critical mass, you can establish a node in Hawaii, you can establish a node in Guam, you can establish a node other places in the Pacific. You've networked the entire Pacific. The Pacific is the largest sort of uh, nonstop region you can network. So that means we can network the entire Earth. But how do we build the airplane so it not only establishes the network, it also sustains the network. So orbs provide logistical support for more orbs. And then how do you manufacture in theater where you manufacture in environment, in solution. So you're building micro factories instead of gigafactories. You're building the underlying technology in your manufacturing processes and you're designing parts from the onset, from the genesis. And this is really only something that a company can do when it's as small as Orb, when it's as new as Orb, because there's no way you can pivot any kind of traditional manufacturing, any kind of traditional, um, uh, even like, like personnel base, like this, it's a hard pivot. And so you have to build the company from the ground up with these underlying assumptions that when I build orbs in theater, I'm not only giving that developing nation the ability to run their entire economy at 10 times the velocity of a developed nation for less cost, I'm also giving them the manufacturing jobs, the technology jobs, the hardware development jobs to run, to actually sustain, become a self-sustaining uh decentralized network for everything and that's the that's the i think that's the it's an order of magnitude i think more significant and more important than just you know move people and things faster this is like this is the same step function that we saw between trains and cars so we draw the parallel of you know you're going to get inside of a metal tube sit next to a stranger a locomotive is an asset you could never afford. A company owns it for you. You pay them, you ride on it. It goes from station to station on tracks. How is that different from airliners today? It's not. We use different words. You still get on a metal tube. You still sit next to a stranger you don't know. You still will never be able to afford a 737. And then at some point, somebody decided that it was worth democratizing automotive. Almost like accessible automotive for all mankind. So like I'm going to take this locomotion, the ability to turn, you know, pistons moving up and down into rotary motion and then move people. I'm going to turn this locomotion, I'm going to make it automotive. And so in order to make accessible automotive for all mankind, they had to you initially start by questioning the underlying assumptions of like how do these things are built, how they're used, what your target market is. And so, you know, even by just saying, you know, for Henry Ford to say, I'm going to build an, an, an automobile, not for the wealthiest among us, but for the 80% of America's population that needs these, doesn't have these. Uh, you can use all of the same words I just used to describe Orb's network and networking the entire earth, and you can apply those to automotive and it's all the same. Um, and... And it, what's fascinating, and, and we didn't, we didn't, uh, it's almost as if we are drawing these in, in parallels intentionally. And this was the fact that we're in Michigan unplanned. Uh, the fact that we're, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, for the longest time I thought I was born in the wrong era, that I was supposed to be, you know, 1943, somewhere on a Corsair over the Pacific, um, you know, as, as, a, as a fighter pilot, the golden age of aviation. And you know what's fascinating is that I think that the golden aviation age of aviation is actually upon us in a way that we could have never expected. You know, I think when you start to compartmentalize, you start to understand that the way the airliner developed was very similar, had a very similar impact to the way that the trains developed, and then there was a successive technology that was built on the the shoulders of it, but was actually completely separate. I think that's the distinction that we fail to make at least in the aerial mobility industry, is that we're not, we're not making the distinction between that is as distinct as locomotive to automotive. It's not the same thing. Orbs are not airplanes. Like, they're not, they're not just airplanes. Like, they're, they're, and that's where you start to say, like, what is a car? 
you then have to use many sentences to describe a car. You can't say an orb is an airplane because those that distinction, that correlation doesn't it doesn't it doesn't exist. Like it, yes, it flies. Yes, a car has wheels, and so does a train. Uh, that's pretty much where the similarities begin to fall off. I think that's the same thing is true for orbs, and you know, I, and I don't want to. Yeah, I don't not, not too much hubris or to be too forthright, but you, there's only a few moments in history where you get to introduce the world to a brand new um, commodity, and when something as impossible as networking the entire Earth becomes a commodity, and you can name it, and you're one of those sort of first couple groups of people who are like, yeah, we can build the Skunk Works for electric aviation in West Michigan. You know, Palo Alto used to be a bunch of ranchers. It used to be for raising cattle, right? And so, you know, West Michigan makes uh, makes soap and shoes um, and furniture. And, and so these parallels, we didn't intentionally develop these parallels between Orb and, you know, say some of the major players in automotive, you know, but we are, we're, we're reinventing manufacturing so that these aircraft can proliferate and democratize aviation for the rest of the world. We are, a, we have an entirely different and much broader target target market, target demographic. Our use case is as generalized as a car's, and and it's not a car, and it's not a flying car, and so it, it doesn't fit in any of the traditional categories of mobility, and so it's new and you have the privilege of working on something new and you have the privilege of of naming something new and that is you know that's something that we're very sober of and uh you know we there's there's heaviness to that uh you know you're responsible for for a lot and you can't always pinpoint exactly what what in your past uh gave you the merit and how you deserved or earned the opportunity to to work on your passions like this and have a global impact, but uh, but it's happening anyway, and 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 so you uh, you humbly accept the responsibility and press on. Very good. So Alex, you you talk about again your orb network uh, replacing or or bringing something to eighty percent of the world that has very little and needs it, right? And you're combining this with with spreading the gospel as well at the same time, which is fantastic. I love that. Tell us a little bit about, you've talked about, you know, it doesn't make sense to be all electric. It doesn't make sense to probably go hydrogen than either, right? There's a lot of other aerospace and some EV tolls are now starting to look at. So, so what are you using to make sure that no matter where you're going, infrastructure existing or just plain and simple it's a it's a dirt floor out in the middle of nowhere where somebody needs needs help food water medical uh, replacement parts gospel people are injured whatever tell me a little bit about what are you using as a, as a fuel as a power to get these things from point a to point b and then yes. create this this network so so we made the distinction early on um, at a subcomponent level, the same way we make distinctions about our, our broader mission, you know, we made a distinction between uh, what we call chemical potential energy and uh, molecular potential energy. And then there's atomic. And so I want to quick describe that because I think this is a useful uh, this is a useful tool for understanding where energy needs to go for mobility. Is that on one side you have lithium ion batteries, so you have two chemicals interacting with each other. And the energy density of that of that chemical potential energy is how much of those two materials can I have pressed up against each other at one time? And so it's the surface area of that. In the middle, you have molecular potential energy. So that's like hydrocarbons. So now you think about if I'm still functioning on the premise of how much of these two materials can I have touching, it becomes not the two materials, it becomes the molecule touching other molecules. So your surface area goes up by an order of magnitude. And then you have atomic, right, which we all know is now at the submolecular level. Um, and that surface area goes up by an increasing order of magnitude. And so you see it's not a battery problem. It's not an energy problem. Uh, well, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's actually just an energy. It is an energy problem. It's not a battery problem. Um, and so 
you see hydrogen start to get at the core of these two components, which is one, you know, let's go back down to the first order uh, engineering of this, which is that I need to, I would like to get away from hydrocarbons for more, for more reasons than just um, the environmental factors. Uh, often they have a limited supply. They're, they're, they're often hard to source. Uh, the machines that burn them um, can be more complicated than they have to be. They require maintenance. There's a variety of of other factors that are going into why hydrocarbons in perpetuity is is probably not the best idea. Um, and and then this and then the second one um, is that I have so I have, I have to get away from the hydrocarbons um, and then I have to produce uh, the correct amount of energy uh, that's at least competitive with with what's out there. And so you start to look at you know, lithium-ion batteries are not an option. Um, hydrogen is starting to move in that direction, but the fuel is not accessible. So um, let's just outperform internal combustion engines on their own turf, um, yeah, which has obviously been a pipe dream for a long time for a lot of people. Um, but we started by saying, what is readily available? Well, agricultural byproduct, um, say, it doesn't have to be hydrogen. It can be hydrogen rich, right? So say like urea or ammonia. Um, and so, you know, NH4, that's one sort of valence nitrogen uh, molecule for every four hydrogen. So if I just make one small difference, I can have 75% the energy density of a pure hydrogen system, but I can find it everywhere in the world. So it's an agricultural byproduct. And if it's a, if it's a you know, electrocatalytic system that doesn't have certain other factors, uh, it can be very low maintenance. It's a solid state system and and it's emission free. Um, and so all of those things are driving us towards other forms of alternative energy. And we actually design our airplanes around the future of those pieces of alternative energy. And they're still, here's one of the crazy things is that a um, an internal combustion engine is a fuel cell. It's taking a hydrocarbon. It's using the carbon to balance the hydrogen where you're burning in a hydrocarbon is the hydrogen and what you're exhausting is the carbon. And so you don't, the, the reality is that even if all you do is stay with hydrocarbons, you don't have to burn it. Like you, there's so many other different avenues we can take when it comes to molecular potential energy, which is where gasoline and diesel and jet A sits. We can go in so many other offshoot chemical routes. You know, hydrogen fuel cells are one of them. Electrocatalytics is one of them. Um, it's a it's a promising one, but it's only one. Burning it is only one. We have a ton of incentives to burn hydrocarbons, which makes sense because we are very good at burning hydrocarbons. We're like a bunch of cavemen uh, who have just discovered. You know, we're, we're we're still at the 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 sort of we've we've this is a very technically developed way of burning wood, um, and so uh, so at, at Orb at least, so we're we're using the energy density of uh, of internal combustion engines, so so diesel, JP8, uh, widely available fuels, um, to establish sort of the initial capability, because we know that today we're we're worried about providing network capability to the world right now, um, and for that reason, you know, you're taking mature technologies like internal combustion engines, you're throwing them in in series uh, hybrid. And you're bolting those to the bottom of the wing, and you're going, you know, at 2,500 nautical miles, because uh, that's what it takes. Um, but in parallel, we're still using fluid-based uh, energy systems. So not a whole, not a, not a, not a, not a, a complete shift away from like some of the basic systemic things you see in a gasoline car. It has a fuel tank, has to get the fuel to an engine that produces power, then it transmits the power to, you know, your output. All that stuff stays the same, but the the chemical um, the the chemical composition of of those components changes, um, and it's going to change dramatically. And how do you build honestly? How do you build an airplane that uh, doesn't have to be redesigned every time there's a change to that chemical composition? Uh, so it gives us the freedom and incentive to develop new energy systems while still using an in-series hybrid um, to you know self-deploy across the Pacific. Mm. Very interesting. So you already talk quite a bit about, again, how you at or with your team are reimagined mobility, not only from a technology perspective, but 
how you're using it again spreading the gospel bringing food helping the underdeveloped nations and going into places again as you said over and over again where 80 percent of the people of the world live but may not even have a street to get to right so it's it's really connecting and creating that network that you're talking about if i were to put you on the spot right here maybe as maybe as the final question is so what is then the next step if you have to if you assume all this is going to happen and it will happen one way or the other you guys are pushing it so what's then the next thing you reimagine mobility to be after all this yeah i mean it's i don't know if you can get much more significant than go forth multiply and subdue the earth right if you lay on your back somewhere where it's dark and you see the number of uh stars that are um, magically moving across the night sky and you realize that we've got things uh, in orbit at any, you know, at the most desolate place in the world, you can still see a part of humanity uh, or something that we made orbiting around us. You're not, I can't, you know, you're, you're taking that piece of like this, this human like what we multiply at orb as much as it is might be the airplane of the network we multiply our relationships if we didn't do this in a humanistic way um then it wouldn't be worth doing if i'm going to multiply conflict if i'm going to multiply greed love of money um it's not worth doing uh it's i'll, I'll put the airplane on the back burner if this isn't going to bring one of the most honestly impactful things uh if, yeah one of the one of the best books I've read recently is the, you know, the book that made your world um, by Vishal Magnawani. And he talks about how, you know, even from an anthrop anthropological perspective, the gospel has is responsible for the vast majority of written languages in the world. The idea that someone would love us so much that he would come to be with us, you know, that I would love it's, I can be driven of one by one of two things, fear or love. Like, I love, I love, I'm driven by love, not just for the things that we make, but for the people that's going to impact, um, that I'm willing to put my life, uh, in my time and my treasure on the line now so I can reach them. And when I reach them, am I going to be spiritually bankrupt or am I going to be full of the Holy Spirit? And, uh, and so that becomes a, a greater and greater priority for me personally. And that's, that's why personal motivation is, uh, man, it's a revol airplanes are revolutionary. Uh, the gospel is that much more revolutionary. It's not just what you can do to the person who's on the ground physically, but how can you feed them spiritually? And, um, and so we're, we're ex honestly, I, I think when you start to go from anywhere, like, you know, West Michigan, I could go to the end of Chile, um, on, in an orb using only the diesel fuel that we find along the way. Um, landing vertically in places that have, have never seen an airplane. Um, when, I think that's going to take a lifetime to fully mature. Uh, I think I, I, thankfully the Lord has given me a lifetime uh, to work on this. Is that's one of the benefits of, of being where we're at. Um, but how much more, how much more could you, you really, you know, it's, it's everybody's reached. That's a, that's a huge it's a huge milestone, and again, we're just honored to be a part of that. I think, I think space is interesting, and space is, uh, you know, space is uh, is worth pursuing. But there's not another human being on the end of that line, um, and that's what I care about: is that there's another person um, at the end of this effort that is going to have their life radically changed. Um, and so, uh, yeah, motivated by love to, uh, to reach the unreached. Wow. Uh that's perfect. Good ending. And uh, you better let me know right away as soon as that uh, <clears throat> vehicle of yours is ready so <laughs> that I don't have to uh, deal with L.A. traffic that I had to deal with again today to get our yeah. get to our office here. I can just fly directly from Michigan to our office here south of L.A. and can avoid a lot of headaches and make those connections that uh, you just talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Alex, for your time. Appreciate it. And... Um, Good luck to you guys going forward, and uh, this is going to be fantastic. And again, the vision that you have, impress us, stay with it, stick with it, and let's do this. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, appreciate you guys' support, and uh, God bless. God bless. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.